So, this morning to get started, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, how many of you out there are in the age group of 18 and 19? You just raise your hand if you're 18 or 19. Just a couple. This is what you actually are, not how you feel. So, <laughs> just a quick reminder. All right, 18 or 19. So, 18 or 19, very young, life's just getting started. You, maybe we, had, we celebrated graduations not a couple weeks ago, and uh, you feel like life is far ahead of you. 1975, May of 1975, a young man by the name of Ricky Jackson. Uh, he was 18 years old, just, had just turned 19, uh, and one night he was arrested. Arrested with two of his friends for a murder in Cleveland. This is a local man in Cleveland had been killed, and they uh, identified he and two of his friends as those who committed the crime. Uh, the problem was there was really no physical evidence even though it seemed kind of like a sloppy robbery, there was really no evidence they could find, and there really were no witnesses. However, they did have a little boy, 12-year-old boy named Eddie Vernon. Eddie was a paper boy, and he uh, stepped up to point to Ricky and his two friends as the ones who did the deed, even though they had no prior records of any sort, and they all had alibis of where they were at the time of the crime. However, three separate juries found Ricky and his two friends, found them uh, guilty, and they sentenced all three of them to execution by the electric chair. Ricky's sentence was later commuted to life in prison when Ohio determined it wasn't going to stomach the capital punishment anymore, and they did not want to execute prisoners. So instead, decade after decade, Ricky languished in prison. Jackson actually had chances to commute his sentence, which involved him admitting his guilt of the crime, but he would not. Ricky maintained his innocence. In 2011, a local magazine printed a story including details about really the, the shaky circumstances and the details on which happened to put Ricky and his two friends in prison. And one of the readers of this article was a pastor. Not just any pastor, but the pastor of the church where Eddie Vernon attended. He talked to Eddie Vernon, and before uh, too long, Eddie rescinded his testimony from when he was 12 years old, now over 50 so after 40 years in prison, Ricky Jackson, 19 to, to age 19 to age 59, uh, Ricky was in unfairly imprisoned in the early days of that time in solitary confinement awaiting death. You know, there's something about someone who's innocent being treated as though they are guilty that stirs our consciences. In fact, it is so powerful that if a wrong conviction can be proven, the government actually pays $50,000 a year in reparations for anyone whose case is found in wrongful imprisonment, and rightly so. I mean, I'm, I'm glad for that sense of justice, quite honestly, to someone who has been so wronged. We want the guilty punished and the innocent set free. Today's passage is all about the guilty and the innocent. It is the well-known narrative of the crucifixion. So much can be and has been said about these events. And we take time as a church at least once a year, on Good Friday if no other time, to look closely at the crucifixion. You know, over the years we've looked at the reality of the crucifixion, the brutality of the crucifixion, the fulfillment that it represents, the grace brought through it. But there's so many depths to plumb. And this morning we will take this other angle as we near the conclusion of the Gospel of Mark. So please note your gray outline handouts in the bulletin and follow along as we will be in the Gospel of Mark and a couple other places looking at specific verses throughout our time this morning. Our passage, Mark 15, is actually found on pages 852 of the Bibles provided in the racks beneath the chair in front of you. So this is one of the great themes of the last day of Jesus' life, the juxtaposition of innocence and guilt. Jesus, the clearly innocent one, the perfect, spotless lamb, declared guilty. This actually starts a little prior to the 15th chapter, 
I hesitate to dig back into a previous passage that we already covered. Tyler did a great job last week in this passage. Um, but you know, I've noticed that there's growing popularity with prequels. So I figured going back a little bit is never a problem in this culture. So it's becoming more and more popular. We can go back. Few observations to make going back into Mark 14. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, we see that Jesus does all things well. He teaches with new authority, clarity, revealing power over unclean spirits, healing many, patiently leading a group of followers, showing his command over creation through controlling the weather, creating food from nothing, correcting wrong and oppressive interpretations of the law, and amazingly, forgiving sins in Mark 2. There's nothing he's done wrong, not even anything he's done poorly. He's lived a perfect life. But as we come up to verse 43 of chapter 14, we see really the first event leading to Jesus' death on the cross. Even though innocent, Jesus is arrested. But for what? He even says to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? So Jesus is arrested like he's guilty. As he says, like a robber. But this, of course, is just the beginning. The next scene in chapter 14 is this trial, if you can even call it that. Bit of a misnomer, as it can hardly be seen as a just trial. Let's take a look together at verses 55 through 59. We'll read the passage together. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. So here they are, breaking the law in multiple ways. Tyler pointed this out last week. But this includes lying under oath, making up stories in order to accuse the only innocent one in the room. So we see also that Jesus was tried as though he was guilty. The narrative here in chapter 14 then jumps over to Peter's denials. We pick back up in the story in verse 1 of chapter 15. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests had a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, delivered him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. You see, the chief priests and elders in their little nonsense trial, they didn't really have the authority to put Jesus to death. That's what they've wanted ever since Mark 3, when Jesus healed the man with the withered hand. So the real judgment has to happen in the court of the Roman provincial governor, the now historically well-known and infamous Pontius Pilate. So the chief priests, elders, scribes, they're all piling accusations onto Jesus, hoping something is going to stick with the governor and they can get what they desire. Verse 3 says they accused him harshly, the innocent accused as though guilty. Pilate even notices all that they say and wonders why Jesus isn't defending himself. It was clear to him their case was weak, but Jesus makes no response, thereby not offering any defense for Pilate to go by. We can even see what he's thinking in this next section as Pilate moves the process forward. Look with me starting in verse 5. Now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he perceived that it was out of envy the chief priest had delivered him up. So he's even showing his hand to the crowd. You want me to release Jesus, right? 
But even in this event, Jesus is presented alongside the insurrectionist and murderer Barabbas. Even though Pilate sees him as less dangerous than the murderer, he's still the innocent one presented as guilty to the crowd. To Pilate's shock, the crowd not only shows their disdain for Jesus, this king of the Jews, as Pilate has heard, but when he asks them what to do with Jesus, their response is stunningly unified. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Now what shall I will do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Herein lies the saddest commentary on the heart of Pontius Pilate. Knowing that Jesus has done nothing wrong, and even stating that to the crowd, he nonetheless turns him over. Jesus, the one he knows, didn't do anything worthy of condemnation. But he is now condemned. Condemned as though he is guilty. Guilty of a capital punishment in the Roman Empire. And then the brutality of the injustice really starts to ramp up. The next portion of our passage shows the soldiers leading Jesus away into the palace. They call together the whole battalion. They clothe him in a purple cloak, twisting together a crown of thorns that they put on him. And they begin to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him, kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him and stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes back on him, they led him out to crucify him. Now, it was probably pretty common to abuse someone who was condemned to death, quite honestly. This is all the more stunning and grotesque because you realize the person we're talking about isn't guilty, but is innocent. I mean, that's what bothers us so much about this. The soldiers are really just doing what first century hired missionaries would naturally do. They abuse Jesus as though he was guilty, heaping justice upon injustice. Here Mark takes a, a quick side note. It is certainly part of the story, um, but nonetheless talking of Simon of Cyrene, compelling a passerby who's coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. The quick excursus here is there's just two things to note about this sentence. One, why is someone coming from the country compelled to bear the cross that Jesus could not physically carry? And that first question answered, Simon is from Cyrene. This is in modern day Libya. So Simon is from Africa. He's probably pressed into service because he's a foreigner, easily identified by his darker skin. And he's also coming from out of town. So he's not part of the crowd involved in cheering on this spectacle. Okay, so why then is he mentioned? Well, because it's incredibly relevant. His sons are known to Mark's audience. And though isn't, it is not a 100% lock on this, the name Rufus appears in Romans 6.13. Paul greets Rufus by name as a member of the church at Rome. It's a historical connection there to be made if you hadn't heard that prior. Sometimes it's really nice to see those connections between the Gospels and the letters uh, to remind ourselves this is all uh, in the same context. This is all a story that connects together. Let's keep moving here, picking it up in verse 22. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, and they offer him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide which each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. So the final stage of the execution begins. Jesus is nailed to the cross and undergoing intense suffering. 
Myrrh is offered, being a slight anesthetic to pain, potentially assisting someone in actually staying alive longer, though deadening the pain at the same time. They take away his clothes. We should note as they cast lots for his clothing, but sometimes the implication of this kind of escapes us. This means that Jesus, the Lord of all creation, is hanging on the cross naked, complete humiliation in the midst of horrific torture. Jesus is punished as someone guilty, tortured even as the injustice mounts, yet sorrowfully, we are still not through it. If you look at me with verse 27 and following, with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also reviling him. Mock and derision are reserved for the worst of the worst. Many of us actually would be hard-pressed to defend mocking someone. Right? I mean, think about what it takes to get to the point where you think mocking is the right thing to do. It seldom is. In fact, mocking itself, I think we would see rightly as being a sinful attitude and practice. Nonetheless, Jesus is here ridiculed, derided, mocked as guilty, as not deserving the least of sympathy or justice. Yet he is God himself the only one worthy of worship. That's who's being mocked. Friends, speaking to my brothers and sisters in Christ, I think we need to be clear. We need to understand the state of our own souls and the souls of all of those around us. The epitome, the epitome of wickedness, the ultimate sin of man, the absolute worst we can do is reject God. We didn't need to stand there and mock Jesus in person. All we have to do is reject his sovereignty and his rightful place as the only one worthy of our worship. Twisting the truth and suppressing it since the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve fell for the lie that God really doesn't have our best interest in mind. The epitome of wickedness is the rejection of God. Filling up the cup of God's wrath. The cup. This is the cup. Christ prayed regarding only hours before in the garden. Tyler walked us through it last week. And now, now this picture changes. Now suddenly we're dealing with something a little different, far beyond the guilt seen in the early portions of this passage. As Tyler pointed out last week, what Jesus asked the Father to remove from him wasn't a cup of emotional or physical pain, but instead the fulfillment of all the wickedness man can and would muster, filling up the cup of God's wrath. Look with me at verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, Behold, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled the sponge with sour wine to put on a reed and give it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let's see whether Elijah will take him down. Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Now, the whole universe responds to the day's events. Even though the sixth hour is just another term for midday or noon, the whole land falls dark. Now Jesus cries out to the Father because above all other guilt projected upon him, he has now been forsaken as guilty, forsaken by the Father. Perhaps all the irony of the previous declarations and mistreatments are actually just pointing to the greatest injustice of all. The perfect one, the God of all creation, drinking the cup of God's wrath that is owed by you and me. 
taking it on so that Jesus, the Son of God's position in the Trinity, mysteriously adjusts so that that can be true, that it can somehow be true that he's actually forsaken by the Father. There is no guilt compared to the guilt of Jesus forsaken. The innocent one forsaken is guilty. Wrapping our minds around this is difficult. Yet the plain words of the gospel tell us so. And now, now all of history is fulfilled. Read along with me in verses 38 and 39. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Mark so often seems minimalistic in his writing. Once again, he actually doesn't say too much, but spills ink only to mention two things, the veil and the centurion. But what does the veil being torn fulfill or reveal? Well, I think Mark is using this because uh, this symbol summarizes all of history for the Hebrew reader. The curtain symbolizes the appropriate separation between God and man. You know, it started way back in the garden. Right? Adam and Eve, Adam disobeyed. They're banished from the garden, removed from God's presence. And that's just the first sign. Then we go on through the Old Testament. Uh, Sticking out for us should be the wilderness at Mount Sinai. The Hebrew people standing at the foot of the mountain were not allowed to touch it. They actually knew it. They begged Moses to allow them to stay away from the mountain because they could not tolerate God's presence. Later on in Exodus 26, we detail the layout of the Hebrew tabernacle. This was the Israelites' mobile temple while they remained outside the promised land of Canaan and where the veil is first spoken of. This is out of Exodus 26, verses 31 through 33. And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twisted linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. You shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. This partition established in the wilderness and then built into Solomon's temple as noted in 1 Kings 8. As the temple was dedicated in that scene, the glory of God comes down and fills the holy of holies and actually spills out past that into the holy place so much so that the priests have to back up and have to flee from God's presence. Then Ezra and Nehemiah, they oversaw the rebuilding of Solomon's temple, and they put a new veil in place. And centuries later, Herod again built another, again with the veil to separate out the holiest place from any man except one, once a year, the consecrated priest. And now, just like that, this veil is torn. The separation of man from God that has been present symbolically and in reality since the fall of the garden has now been removed? How? How does Mark say it's been removed? Why has that happened? Mark next says what the centurion says. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. For those of you who are familiar with the crucifixion story, uh, it's possible that we've done ourselves a bit of a misservice with the centurion. And obviously we've now made movies about the centurion's life. And I love the idea of thinking that this this hardened Roman centurion, right, eventually turns his life over to the Lord after seeing Jesus dying on the cross. That is um, a really neat thing to think about. The problem is with the centurion's, uh, the centurion's place in this passage is about the words he says not about who he is, right? The words he says, says truly this man was the son of God. Now this is referenced in Matthew as well and Luke as well. The problem is they aren't the same words. In Matthew, the words are exactly the same. In Luke, it says that uh, the centurion said that the man was innocent 
or that he was righteous, depending upon what version you read. So why the difference in language? Well, essentially, they are saying the same thing. They are saying exactly the same thing, and that's why the words uh, are so important to think through what is the meaning of what the centurion's saying versus the thinking in the centurion's head itself. Certainly, the man was innocent or righteous basically means that what Jesus was saying about himself was true. He was innocent, he was righteous, because he said he was the son of God. That's who he is. And the centurion is acknowledging what he said he was, his crime that he's being crucified for, he actually is telling the truth. That is who he is. He was innocent. He's righteous because he is the Son of God. The symbolism is this. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. It is he who enters the Holy of Holies and lays himself down on the altar obliterating the need for anyone to be separated by a curtain. But let's let Scripture do the talking versus my words. I want to turn us into the passage we'll spend uh, kind of the rest of the time in, and this is in Hebrews. Hebrews starting in chapter 9. So if you want to flip over there, we'll take a look at a few different verses. Starting in Hebrews 9.11. Hebrews 9 and 10, I encourage you, um, I am skipping over a massive amount of truth in these two chapters. Uh, This is just incredibly deep. I encourage you to dig deep into the book of Hebrews, particularly chapters 9 and 10, if you want to grasp the depth of the crucifixion and its meaning, its symbolism, how it connects to the Old Testament. These are just wonderful chapters to dig deep in. A lot of things are said over and over again to nuance the importance of understanding this. Verses 11 and 12, chapter 9. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood and goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Now skip down to verse 24 of chapter 9. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. And now to chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Like I said, I skipped a massive amount of truth in there, but I really uh, cannot take the time to read through both chapters. The veil is torn because Jesus appeared as a high priest, and he didn't just enter a room on earth. Okay, if we think about the temple and sitting on the temple mount and the veil being torn, it's not about Jesus going into that room. It's about Jesus going into heaven itself to appear in the presence of God for us. This is how he secured our redemption for us. He could only do it if he said, if he was who he said he was, the Son of God. Our passage this morning has two more verses, verses 40 and 41. As we, find, as we often find the case, Mark always has a reason for what he includes. You can stay in Hebrews, you can flip back. I will read verses 40 and 41 of Mark 15. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and of Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him. And there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Many of the commentators, even those from the much more strongly patriarchal pre-modern era, give credit to these women as standing strong when the disciples 
were absent. Mary Magdalene was healed by Jesus. Mary was the mother of disciple. And Salome is noted as being the wife of Zebedee. That means the mother of James and John. And then Mark mentions <clears throat> many other women. All women. And simply put, I think Mark has included them here as a reference to the witnesses for this event. The disciples would hear the details of the cross, at least in part, from these women, even as they would hear of the empty tomb a few days later. The testimony of these women are invaluable to the church. And we must keep in mind that no matter how a society or a particular culture values someone or some people group, we are all created equal before God and have equal access to God. And Jesus, during his most troubling hours, had a host of women followers there mourning his death, despite the personal danger of identifying with him. So we've seen our passage here, the long trail of opportunities where the innocent is made guilty. And how really the tearing of the veil and the declaration by the centurion fulfill all of history. And that is so that the guilty may be made innocent. Ricky Jackson was innocent for the crime he was punished for. And that should bring us all a sense of relief when efforts to right wrongs are able to happen. But Ricky Jackson like the rest of us in this room, is still guilty. We're all guilty of the rejection of our Creator God. As we noted before, that is the epitome of wickedness. You know, all the religions of the world focus on improving ourselves, whether via enlightenment or working to please God, thinking we can outweigh the bad with good. All of that fails because there's no way to earn God's pleasure with basic guilty hearts because of our sin. So, all sorts of passages affirm this in the Bible, just as they affirm the above passages in Hebrews about our dependence on Christ. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, the family of God, let's glory in these words, Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19 that I read before, but going on further. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love, to good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So what is our reaction to being the guilty made innocent? To be made clean when we know that the trash that's in our hearts. This passage attempts to draw it out for us. There are other passages we could have gone to for similar instructions, certainly. But what we're seeing here is really about followers of Jesus having conviction and showing commitment. Not a conviction we muster up in ourselves, or a commitment we make to something that we really are only doing out of a sense of duty. Instead, this conviction is to hold fast onto our hope that the innocent one has allowed us as the guilty to draw near, to approach God in prayer, and to know that he hears us. You know, we need to balance reverence for the Almighty God who has stooped to hear us with the fact that Paul says in Romans 8 that we also cry out to him as dad, a really strong sense of familiarity. 
with the same notion, Jesus rebuked his disciples when he told them that the kingdom of God belongs to children. What Jesus says there is that a lot of times our approach to God isn't really about his reverence. It's more about our own pride. Let's be genuine in prayer. The New American Standard Version in Hebrews 10 calls it having a sincere heart. Let's be genuine in prayer and commit ourselves to pray passionately and continually, wholeheartedly. The other way this conviction and commitment flow out here in Hebrews 10 is really how we interact with one another. I think a lot of us may view one another in the church as though we really need to earn each other's trust. What we need to establish and reestablish in our minds is that Jesus Christ died for us when we were still sinners. He dies for his enemies. And at times we struggle to tolerate our friends. If Christ died for me, then there is no one in this building or this world for that matter, that I'm too good for. If Christ died for you, then withholding forgiveness only builds a case that maybe you don't understand the gospel. If Christ died for us, then when our brother or sister has something against us, we take the natural posture of being the one in the wrong and seeking to reconcile. We need to consider that we ourselves are all sinners, still prone to think and act wrongly toward one another. You know, naturally, we love to categorize one another. We we make assumptions about preconceived notions in order to interpret what we experience or what we see from a distance. That's called judgmentalism. And yes, that's a sin. And that's why Paul spends an entire chapter in Corinthians One that we often use at weddings, which is delightful, but that's not his point. His point is to remind us that all the greatest doctrine, all the greatest theological speeches, all those great things are nothing compared to love. So we do not want to be a clanging gong or an out-of-tune symbol in the church. We want to be a harmonious delight and a sweet aroma. And for you here who would not consider yourselves to be followers of Jesus or maybe not really sure where you're at, the veil was torn and had to be torn and could only be torn by the same one who could enter the holy place made without hands in heaven. That transaction can only be done by the man who is God and the God who became man, Jesus Christ. You are not innocent you are guilty. And though, even now, you may thumb your nose at God in outright rejection or maybe thinking all the excuses that you have of why you don't believe, maybe even excuses that you can stump your Christian friends with, none of that will matter because we will all face God. We will all stand before God. And when you face God, your excuses are going to melt away. All the arguments that you think you have will be seen for the silliness that they are. They will dissolve into vapor before his righteousness. And you will feel exposed and naked before God's perfect holiness. Unless, unless you put your hope in what Jesus did on the cross In his work, not your own. In his goodness, not your own. In his perfection, of which you have no part unless you submit to him. If I can plead with you on this one point, please allow your ears to hear these beautiful words new. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever 
believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.